Israel is at a point of looking for peace, now more than ever. I believe that in looking at a way forward and finding a harmonious way forward, we need to understand much of the ideology behind the radical elements, like Hamas. Yesterday we heard Bridget Gabriel explaining how it's the radical minority that drives the agenda. She gave us some examples. So let's explore that radical minority. And to explain the psychology of a terrorist is uh, a former PLO suicide bomber. And I'm very, very proud to welcome Walid Shubat to The Morning Mayhem. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me this morning. Walid, you were a former, or you are still a former PLO uh, suicide bomber. How did it go from you being born a sweet, innocent, beautiful child to becoming a suicide bomber? Help me understand the psychology behind that. Actually, I wasn't a suicide bomber. I was meant to plant the bomb and leave the leave the scene. Yes. Uh, so the suicide bombing came later after Yahya Ayash, a Palestinian who basically uh, invented the suicide belt. Israelis, of course, finally got him in a in a telephone uh, bombing in which they sent him a telephone w- which had explosives and kind of killed him. So. If you live by the bomb, you shall die by the bomb, in my view. Mm -hmm. But the idea of uh, suicide bombing uh, developed from taking Islamic concepts or Islamic history. Uh, For example, you had Jafar al-Tayyar in Islam, in which he was hailed as a, a suicide jihadist by the suicide bombers when he entered into the battlefield knowing he's by himself and he will die and he got basically killed in the battlefield. So that the idea of lunging yourself against your enemy and dying stems from this uh, history of Islam with with this kind of uh, uh, f- uh, f- uh, fancy talk of, of, of the glorification of one dying for the cause of Allah in jihad, in which there is a salvific... Uh, a benefit for the Muslim in regards to what the Prophet of Islam uh, taught in which by the drop of the martyr's blood, by the first drop, in fact, of the martyr's blood, he will enter paradise and his sins are forgiven. So in other words, it's an issue of salvation, sort of like the Christian who believes that the blood of Jesus, you know, uh, forgives all your sins. In the case of the Islamist, they believe that it's their own blood that can be the redemption of their own sin. And it's the way to assure themselves to go to paradise because in Islam, there is no assurance of this salvation unless you die as a martyr. So by the time I reached to high school, my sheikh uh, or the teacher named uh, Naim Ayyad and Zakaria, Sheikh Zakaria, were graduates of the Al-Azhar University. This is the number one university par excellence in the Sunni Muslim world. Uh, and the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood permeated the society from that time. In fact, people say the Muslim Brotherhood had no influence, which is not true in those times. From the 70s, we had Muslim Brotherhood infiltrate the schools and the education system, in which they began to teach the students that uh, dying for the cause of Allah is the most noble cause. It's the sixth pillar of Islam, if you will, uh, that jihad is, is the main goal against the Jews. In fact, I remember in the class, what do we do with the Jews after we kill all the men? Because in Islam, it's forbidden to kill the women. But you take the women as concubines. Well, how do you have children with concubines if there's no marriage? Uh, In other words, there is a moral question that we asked in class, going to my father, who was a school teacher, who also taught Islamic studies. You know, he reaffirmed what Mr. Sheikh Zakaria Naim Ayyad taught us, that you can... Uh, that you can have children with concubines, which will be the Jewish women at that time, uh, and there is, uh, you don't have, to, it's, the sexual act is not even consensual, which means rape. I says, you know, dad, we, we taught rape in school. And so now we see the ISIS, we see what's going on in Syria and Iraq, we see uh, the mayhem. For the last two decades, we've been preaching this, it turns out that we were correct and the critics were wrong. So there is myth versus fact when it comes 
to the issue of understanding the mindset that most Westerners think that the terrorist mindset exists in a vacuum, sort of like a cult process in which they are hidden uh, and out of the scene. In fact, that's not true at all. Uh, when my cousin uh, Ra'id Shoaibat uh, was killed by the Israelis on his way to bomb Ben Yehuda Street in Israel, the entire village walked into the ceremony of the edification of the martyr because now he's in paradise. He had received the Huris. Uh, he is in heaven with the wide-eyed Huris. And his mother, my Aunt Fatima, would cry at night. But in daytime, she would be passing candy in the streets. So we have to understand it is an entire culture amongst especially the Palestinians. Walid, how does, how does one change that? How does one negotiate with that, with, well, with that culture? Because is, that's a culture of death. Is it, you know, how does, how does one work with that? Well, the, the, you know, the best way to answer the question is to go back to the greatest atrocity of the Jewish people, and that is the Holocaust and Nazism. How do we negotiate with the Nazis? Where any, was anyone able to negotiate with the Nazis? We go to Chamberlain, you know, and his failed attempt to negotiate with Hitler. And he coming back, he has the promise of Hitler. He never kept that promise, of course. So there is no way to get a promise from an entity, let's say like Hamas or, or Fatah even. Fatah had even partnered, or the PA, they call it today, yeah. partnered with Hamas. And uh, in their Article 12, it, uh, they talk about the, era- quote, the eradication of Zionist economic, political, military, and cultural existence. This has nothing to do with the creation of a state of Palestine. This has something to do with the wiping out of the cultural existence of the Jewish people. This is the same ideology of the Nazi. So in the same way, the only way to deal with Nazi ideology is through defeating it. And as Netanyahu wants to dis- a disarmament in Gaza, uh, he is correct. There is no other way but to disarm this enemy and to basically defeat the God ideology because it is, no matter how much they say, us, it's not a us versus them, it is the ideology of what they have in their mind as Allah portrayed versus the ideologies of the Jewish and the Christian communities in which they believe of a different concept of God, that God is a God of love, that God values life, in which the Islamists will say, we honor death more than you, as you honor life. So the, the, the systems are quite the opposite than each other. We look at communalities with Islam, but that's a problem when people of, you know, uh, uh, peace-minded people look at communalities in order to gain peace with the other side, what needs to be addressed in dialogues is the differences. And there are major differences. Israel doesn't have such an article uh, that says we, we want to wipe out the Palestinian cultural existence, Islamic cultural existence, or Arabic cultural existence. This is a different concept, that it's the culture of the Jews. Today, we see in, in Europe, they're no longer crying out death to the Zionists, but clearly death to the Jews. They want to burn Paris to the ground. They're on the streets. And these are not Hamas operatives. This is the regular Muslim populace doing this in Europe. So we need to understand this is not only one Nazi Germany. This is several Nazi Islamo fascists in several fronts from the Khalafa in Syria and Iraq, from Erdogan of Turkey, uh, uh, from uh, Al-Qaeda, from the Muslim Brotherhood, from the Palestinian Authority, uh, even from the secular Arabists who still view some of these things and, and adore these kind of concepts, uh, they don't go all the way as Hamas does or as the Muslim Brotherhood or as the Wahhabists do. But nevertheless, this permeated the Arab culture ever since the inception of the State of Israel in 1948. Walid, if you were in Benjamin Netanyahu's shoes today, what would you do? What action would you take? I mean, right now there's a ceasefire. Um, the troops are being pulled out of Gaza. What would you do? Would you reverse well, I would, that? I will ignore the hum and drum that goes on the media. Usually the media and all the outcries of saving Gaza, so on and so forth, is usually forgotten after a while. So we should not pay attention to the static that goes on in the media, because even amongst the Arab populations, there are many who support under the under the rug, if you will, uh, 
what Israel is doing with Hamas amongst Egyptians. There are much support of what Israel is doing, even among Saudi Arabians. There is much support to what Israel is doing. So uh, we need to ignore. You know, I remember in 1967 when the media was calling out to destroy Israel, so on and so forth. And the Arabic media was lying, saying that they've uh, purified Jerusalem from all Jews and so on and so forth. The moment we saw the tanks uh, come through when we were living in Jericho with the Star of David, uh, the population, in fact, many were very elated to see Israel victorious against the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. Life turned out to be much better. Prices went down. My father received two salaries, one from Jordan and one from Israel. Uh, and things were very peaceful and very hunky-dory. I must confess and testify. I was there as a child, and there was no rape, no pillage, no robbing. In fact, Arabs were robbing other Arabs, and the Israelis were scrambling, trying to uh, rescue Arabs and rescue shops and this kind of thing. And so uh, the Israelis were valiant in battle. They uh, attempted always to uh, uh, have the least amount of bloodshed in this battle and respecting everyone. In fact, even today, the Palestinian Authority these days show their footage in which they themselves admit. They show this footage to the Palestinians in Gaza uh, regarding what Israel does in bombing Gaza. And they show this clip in which they give the procedure of how Israelis behave in Gaza. They say they give a warning to the terrorist in his home to leave his house. So Israel does blow up bombs, uh, sorry, does blow up homes. And that is, if you participate in the act of terrorism to kill Jewish civilians, you will lose your home. I believe it's a fair deal. Uh, it's even more fair for the Palestinians. I mean, they can kill Jews, and the only thing they're going to endure is to live in a tent. So they even show in the clip, the first uh, attack is a sound bomb. The plane sends a sound rocket that just makes sound. It has no explosive charges whatsoever. Mm. And it makes the sound of a bomb in which people must clear the home. They have two minutes. And then two uh, sh rockets will hit that home and destroy only that home. And... So there is Israel trying to save terrorist lives, not civilian lives only. You have the case in the Shifa hospital in which the media there, everybody in the media hailed on Israel as killing Palestinian civilians when an Italian journalist showed very clearly and explained clearly that the rocket that was about to be launched against Israel exploded prematurely and killed Palestinian civilians in which the media from Press TV and onwards went over there and began to kind of shower the world of atrocities of the state of Israel. This is all fabrication. We know it, but the media uses such fabrication just to demoralize Israel. Walid, um, before we wrap up, I want to speak to you about your personal story, if you don't mind. How did you go from a terrorist mentality of blow up, kill, um, maximum casualties uh, to where you are today? Well, it is a change of mind, you know. That's why I believe to change the ideology of an Islamist has not, doesn't have much to do with trying to convey to them that there is no God. But a different concept of God sure helps a lot. And I believe that uh, proselytization, and of course the Jewish community doesn't believe in proselytization, well, that's the way they do things, but Christians do have proselytization, and I believe that to proselyte the Islamist, to have a different concept of God, specifically a Christian concept, it tends to eliminate the problem. All the ex-terrorists that I know became Christians. So uh, I studied the Bible, I was fascinated with the Old Testament, uh, I was fascinated with the uh, with several books in the Old Testament, in which I read the book of Amos, if I may share, you know, Jewish biblical verses, sure. uh, in which God said, I will plant them in their land, that is the Jewish people, uh, in Amos chapter 9, verse 15, that God will plant the Jewish people back in their land. 
and Amus continues to stay, and no longer shall they be pulled up out of that land. It's impossible to uproot the Jews once they are planted at this time. If we look at that one half of a verse, we find that this cannot be a historic context. The Jewish people were uprooted by the Babylonians. They were uprooted by the Romans in 70 AD. So this can only constitute a verse pertaining to our times. So I began to think that either the Jewish authors of these books were perfect guessers of the scenario that we live today, or they were prophets, and indeed, they had a direct call to God. It was a local call from Israel, in which God told them Israel will be reestablished. So I do believe in the God of Israel. I do believe that, uh, as in the Hebrew, Henne lo yanum velo yishan shomer Yisrael. He neither sleeps nor slumbers, the one who watches over Israel. I believe that there is miraculous things happening in which, you know, some of these bombs, just even the dome, uh, the Iron Dome couldn't, uh, you know, uh, wouldn't have been able to stop. There was an eastern wind and somehow... That's an amazing these story, huh? Explosives didn't harm Israelis and Jewish people. Yeah. The Scud missiles of, of Saddam Hussein, 1967. If I looked at six, six Days War, Joshua had a Six Days War. If you look at the text on the seventh day, on the dawning of the day, the day hasn't even begun on the seventh day. Israelis basically established the state of Israel. There's never been a Six Days War except in two or three places in history. And two of them happen to be in the state of Israel. So I love those kind of things. And I, I, I changed my mind. I began to love the Jewish people because I began to honor life and understand even from my own family. I can tell you testimonies from my own family who hate Israel, who can testify under the rug that Israel is a great nation and the Jewish people are great people. So let's remove, in a perfect world, let's remove Hamas and Hamas ideology from the picture. Do you think that Israelis and Palestinian people have a way living in harmony going forward? Well, it depends on what constitutes removing Hamas ideology. The problem of the ideology is that it stems from the Quran and how they view the Quran. Mm. Is it possible to reinterpret the Quran? It will be a very difficult job. It has to happen from the Muslims themselves. And that's quite an impossibility and quite a very difficult achievement. Because Hamas has a reverence to Islamic doctrine. Hamas says that the Islamic resistance movement believes that the land of Palestine is an Islamic waqf consecrated for the future of Muslim generations until Judgment Day. These are eschatological views portrayed by the Prophet of Islam himself, that the Day of Judgment shall not come to pass until the tribes of Islam defeat the tribes of Israel, in which the, 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 the Jews will cry out, uh, there is a, 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 sorry, the stones cry out. There's a Jew hiding behind me. Come, O Muslim, come, O servant of Allah, come and kill him. So we need to, le- to uh, address the eschatological mindset of the Islamist. His glorification of martyrdom in which he views heaven in a way that uh, this sexual relations in heaven with boys and virgins and so on and so forth, the glorification of even eating human flesh, in fact, you know, it was the Palestinians who, prior to an Nusra, when the terrorist on video in front of the whole world, in fact, we spoke about it before it happened. He took the heart of a Syrian soldier, ate it in front of the camera. The Muslims supersede this in, uh, in, in Palestine, in which you have the children being educated in the Arabic language to cry out in the Arabic, Akula lahma mughtasibi. I eat the flesh of my occupier in which you see Palestinians in Ramallah standing with the entrails of two Jewish soldiers, putting the entrails close to their mouths as they're eating their flesh. So this cannibalistic view is not something that exists only in the streets of Ramallah, but was taught very clearly on Anas TV, the prominent Muslim television by the Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt. So this is not just something that happens in the street. It is taught ideologically. Now, not all Muslim scholars agree with this kind of concepts. Nevertheless, it does exist, and that needs to be combated. Well, Ed, we're going to have to leave it there, and I thank you so much for speaking to me this morning and for your insights. I really do feel 
that you are incredibly insightful. You don't mince your words. You are very honest, and I thank you for that. You bet. Thank you for having me. Thank you very, very much. That's uh, Walid Shuabat.